Hello, jean -Dou. Hello, Kevin. One of the things people will notice if they try and make any kind of psychophysical change is sometimes fear comes up. So if you do something new, it feels wrong or weird. Uh, and the old way, even if it's not benefiting you, can feel safe and uh, normal and right. So what's your thoughts on how fear relates to this work? Is it something to be avoided or is it something to be used and embraced? Well, yes, it's, uh, it's a very important question and most people are talking about it. There are many ideas and the first to talk about it in this uh, uh, situation was uh, FM Alexander. And uh, it, it's interesting to uh, exactly recall what he was talking about and uh, see how modern Alexander Technique is using uh, the idea of uh, what we call the undue excitement of the fear reflexes. There are many modern Alexander teachers, I was listening to one yesterday, that are um, in fact uh, trying everything not to uh, stimulate the fear response of the, the pupil. Uh, there are many ideas behind that that are associated with uh, reflexes. So I thought it was quite an interesting thing because we were discussing the criterion of uh, what is uh, the good use of what well, the good general use of the self and uh, to, to start discussing this, uh, this notion of reflex and of course with it the notion of fear reflexes. Very often you will hear that uh, young children display uh, some sort of uh, instinctive perfect use. And so uh, we are told sometimes that uh, there are reflexes, which uh, when they are working well, uh, ensure uh, good use or good general use. So uh, yes, we, we are presented uh, some good reflexes that have evolved during millions of years of uh, the human uh, condition. And uh, we are told that uh, the child display good use, good general use, so that uh, the mechanism of the torso, as we will see, that is uh, for Alexander, uh, the central condition or the primary control of the use of the self is, uh, is well organized by uh, these good reflexes. But there comes a time where the child has to go to school uh, very often, uh, the position of the Alexander teacher, uh, I remind, uh, it reminds me of uh, uh, Lauren Smith, uh, a Canadian teacher, who tends to blame a uh, school institution for uh, triggering fear reflexes in pupils. And so after a while, uh, instead of the good use uh, that we can see in this uh, little child, there will be, um, in fact, incorrect responses that are going to be integrated by the child. And uh, as a result of um, these uh, uh, strong fear reflexes that the children has and will be triggered by the necessity to perform, uh, the wanting to, uh, to, to be part, to, to succeed. And so this is obviously wrong in his mind. And um, what is very strange in this idea, in this uh, presentation of uh, bad use, is that uh, the teacher is opposing why good reflexes that have been evolved during millions of years and bad reflexes. It's very strange how you can uh, imagine conscious guidance uh, with these ideas in mind. Yes. And so um, what was Alexander's position in this is, is quite interesting. Yes. Uh, and because it's Alexander who was the first, was the first one, well, in our community to, of course, uh, start really talking about fear reflexes. And so you must understand that um, for Alexander, uh, his technique, when he, uh, well, invented it, 
was uh, for the control of human reaction. It's, uh, it was not for a control of stimuli. Of stimuli. It, it, his idea was not to try and leave the child in, in a nice environment where no stimulation, nothing would be uh, asked of him. It would just be accepted how he is. This is, this is a notion of uh, being accepting students how they are is, uh, is very strong in, in some uh, psychological tendencies in the modern Alexander technique. And um, all the teacher has to do is to communicate his use of the self, his fantastic use of the self, and is going to, in fact, calm down. The pupil. There is this idea that the pupil is overly excited and must be calmed down. I wonder how it's possible that somebody has not seen that this was total and gaining. That the pupil is excited, it must be calmed. This is just and gaining. There was there is no mean you are not offering any means whereby to somebody if you try to protect him from or her from from stimulation. It's it's absolutely strange how ideas can turn around when people don't reason out things, when they don't and also when then when they do not read uh, properly. So uh, Alexander in in this uh, is very clear. Uh, his idea has never been to protect the pupil. Uh, if you remember, he's been criticized very much because um, when he ran a first training course in, in Australia, in Australia, he had a few, a, a group of students and uh, he trained the, his, this group of students who were not uh, actors and they were complete beginners. He trained them to perform a play, a Shakespeare play. Um, and um, it's, it's quite interesting because um, he, for the first, the premiere, uh, they were thrown onto stage without a prompter. So uh, the demand on their memory and also their capacity to react to being on stage, to being under, you know, the, the habitual pressure of being uh, uh, what we call stage fright, of being, in fact, scrutinized by uh, an audience. Well, they, they dealt with it, but they didn't deal with it by lying down on the floor, by trying to calm themselves. They dealt with it with the principle of the Alexander Technique. And uh, that is uh, totally forgotten nowadays, that uh, we, we are teaching people how to control human reaction. And we are using a principle in order to achieve this goal. This, uh... So uh, the other day, uh, I, I had a lesson, a Zoom lesson with a very uh, uh, far country. And... Um, the pupil, I ask the pupil every time if they have a comment on their last lesson or if they have a question. And she say, no, I haven't got a comment. I, have a, I, have a, I haven't got a question, but a comment. In fact, um, I, every time we have a lesson, before we have the lesson, I, I'm very, very stimulated. I say, well, that's nice. But she said, no, it's not really. I have a big... Uh, feeling of apprehension. And so this is interesting. I said, uh, can you explain? She said, yes, you're, you're asking uh, me to reason. You're asking me questions I have to answer. And then when I answer, I have to, in fact, uh, perform in order to show my understanding. And so this is uh, really triggering a uh, great response in me. And so, uh, I acknowledge this fact. The, the lessons that I give are, are made in this way so that uh, the pupil will be stimulated. Well, the, if you want, the fear reflexes of the person will be stimulated. The person has to know how to deal with that. Yes? And uh, it's very important to understand the principles uh, that Alexander invented in relation with how to deal with these, uh, well, difficult conditions. 
when you think about it, uh, learning something is uh, learning something you're not very good at, uh, something you don't know, something that for you is uh, beyond your habitual range of control. And uh, apprehension in this case is logical, but you have to understand that this apprehension has to be controlled. Because if you can't control this kind of apprehension, well, you can learn, it's impossible to learn anything. If for you learning is uh, uh, feeling a nice experience, well, you will be confronted with reality. Is that uh, when you are uh, uh, learning something, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make errors. You're, you're, you, well, you're not going to appear at uh, your perfect best. Uh, it's, it's not the point. The point is completely elsewhere. There is also something very interesting in discovering something new. Even it's a bit, uh, it's a bit frightening. So there is one thing is to understand these kind of apprehension and integrate this apprehension. Yes. And there is another thing. It's to use uh, this idea of fear reflexes to, ex to explain almost everything. Because uh, that's uh, nowadays what we what we find is that um, very often we are told that uh, the wrong use of the self is due to fear. And uh, what is uh, proposed is uh, the the auditory blink reflex as a model. So. This is what we call uh, the startle pattern in the, the Alexander Technique jargon. And so I'm going to show you a very well-known image. Yes, we see uh, that a person is standing and then at one moment that is unexpected, a very sound noise is produced and uh, we see a picture, uh, well, quite customary of uh, what we call the auditory blink reflex or the startle pattern. And I've heard many teachers say that, uh, in fact, uh, we tend to go through life with a tendency of uh, excessive uh, uh, reaction. Yes. And so this explains uh, the neck uh, tension. And so it's necessary to lie down and it's necessary to find uh, an appointed, very good uh, touch teacher that is going to bring you to calm and to, in fact, uh, organize a new reaction. Well, you, this, is, uh, this is acceptable at first until you start reading about, uh, about the reflex. You, you start discovering that uh, uh, Alexander's position on this is very clear. And so well, the first thing I, I discovered was that uh, when, you, when you read the, the scientific text, what you find is that um, it's not as clear cut as it looks. Here is uh, uh, Brown and Rothwell that I like very much. And they say the most general startled response to the standard sound stimulus employed consists of eye closure, grimis grimacing, neck flexion, trunk flexion, slight abduction of the arms, flexion of the elbows, and pronation of the forearms. There was a considerable variation in the degree to which this response was expressed. And in some subjects, only eye closure and flexion of the neck was apparent. Well, there has been more uh, studies on this and it's also apparent that it's possible to have, uh, to, to in fact inhibit nearly most of the response. But what is interesting is that the inhibition is not um, a decision to inhibit, it uh, rests on uh, different characteristics that have to be prevented before uh, the person is subjected to the experiment. 
What it means is that uh, if uh, you change the general use of the self, well, you find that uh, the response to the same stimulus is going to be very diminuted, very different, yes, much less. So uh, suddenly, this uh, starts to match what FM Alexander was talking about. Because um, uh, I have an example here, and this is not in the first book. This is in the last one. This is not the young Alexander. This is the Alexander that has, uh, uh, you know, we are told very often that at the end of his life, uh, of his teaching life, Alexander uh, let go of ordering, let go, uh, dis completely dismissed uh, his, uh, his ideas, and it was just uh, a direct touch with the contact, direct contact with the pupil that would do the trick. No, he's, descri he's describing a case here. He says, sp special to this case was the undue excitement of the fear reflexes in response to any stimuli to move or speak. The lessons I gave were based on the principle that the pupil manner of general use was responsible for the trouble. The pupil manner of general use. And so uh, if you look again at uh, this experiment, you will find that the gentleman posture, the general use of the mechanism of the torso, is uh, it's quite striking that uh, this gentleman has a very strong response to uh, the, the loud sound that is produced unexpectedly, but um, his habitual use is, in fact, making him ready for that kind of response. The principle Alexander is using is that if that gentleman can learn to organize the different movements of the different parts of the torso in such a way as to promote a lengthening and widening, then the neck will not be constricted all the time. And so when the new use will be installed, will be established, the production of any stimulus that uh, should trigger a fear response, well, is going to be much less than this. The control of human reaction in Alexander, in the Alexander technique or the initial Alexander technique, the theory that is presented in his books is that um, you do not control the stimulus. You do not try and control the response. You control the general use of the, the general manner of use. And uh, through this control, you establish new conditions. And the new conditions uh, use affect functioning, use affect functioning in reaction, in activity. That's the, that's the, that's the idea of the Alexander technique. So uh, we do not ask the person to, to lie down and to rest and to calm down. No, we stimulate the person and discover with her how she can use verbal instructions in order to guide our mind. And uh, not only guide our mind uh, as if to resist uh, fear stimulation, no, guide our mind to nonetheless, the, the, no matter what the conditions are, which means no matter what she feels, no matter what she hears, no matter what she's told, well, she can still continue to reason out because that's the first problem. The first problem is not that the person is going to be tensed or shorten the neck. No, the first problem is that the person is going to be cut from the communication with her reason. That's the uh, Alexander idea. So um, let's have a look at this. Alexander says that uh, the average person may exhibit complete nerve control and balance. Well, which, which is uh, somehow the opposite of uh, the reaction that we see with, uh, when there is an undue excitement 
for uh, of the fear reflex. Well, I should say when there are conditions of undue excitement of the fear reflex. So there are conditions where the average person may exhibit complete nerve control and balance. That is during accustom experiences. An accomplishment of the different mental or physical demands made during the ordinary round of life. So very often you will find that uh, there are some uh, students in Alexander training course that are, well, yes, they are exhibiting nerve control and balance uh, during accustomed experience, accustomed experiences with their, their teachers. And so they have, they have learned to react and to act with them, with, their, with the hands of their teachers on them. And, and you will, well, you will look at them and, well, it looks, looks quite nice. Yet the same person, when uh, having a simple lesson, a Zoom lesson with me, far away, is uh, in fact in the grip of a very strong apprehension reaction to simply being asked to perform uh, reasoned acts that she has, re that she, well, uh, from answers that she has provided herself. I ask her a few questions and she, she answered truthfully. And I say, well, if this is the case, could you show me? Could you, could you please uh, sit, for example, on your chair following the, uh, uh, this means whereby you have yourself reasoned out? When you have uh, answered this question, you have reasoned out a few means whereby. What should, do the, what, what should be the ribcage movement when I'm going to sit? So you have answered. It should be this. It should rotate forward and up at the top. Just show me. When we discover that, wow, in your activity, it seems quite difficult to translate the theory into practice. This is just the basis of, of giving lessons. Uh, you reason out what should be the uh, means whereby to produce the gesture, which is going to expand the mechanism of the torso, the primary control of the functioning and uh, primary control, if you want, of human reaction. And then when you, when you discover that um, it's not possible to translate into activity, then we should start to uh, see what are the movements that are appearing that are impeding that uh, means whereby decision of yours and uh, how to, in fact, coordinate all these movements in order to, well, improve the reaction and improve the general manner of use. So it's one thing to, to look fantastic when you have learned a dance with somebody. So the person has, a, you know how to react to the different uh, helps that the teacher is going to do with his hands so that the, the result seems to please the teacher. But it's a different thing to command on your own uh, movements that are going to coordinate and produce a general use that is satisfactory. So there is first this capacity to have complete nerve control when you're lying down on the table. But then there is uh, going on stage. Then there is performing in front of an audience. And uh, for example, you have uh, an exam. There is nothing wrong with tests and exam. It's just to, to see what you are capable of doing on your own. It's, it's one thing to do something with the help of someone, and then it's something else to be asked to perform something on your own. This is uh, for, for actors, for example, uh, this is uh, commonplace. The, there is nothing wrong about being stimulated. And so, Alexander is saying that when suddenly confronted with the unexpected or unknown, he betrays undue apprehension and loss of control. Even when the new experience may not hold any real terror 
for him or for her. There is no, um, there is, there is no terror in, uh, in being stimulated to learn something. It's, uh, it's, there is excitement. There is uh, this idea of exploring something new of our own reaction to stimulation. The idea is not to try and, and make a, a nice environment for the pupil. I always reacted to this. It's, uh, it's incompatible with learning new things. It's absolutely incompatible with learning new coordinations of movements because new coordinations of movements are going to be stimulating too. You, you are going to feel very, very wrong. There are uh, some uh, very deep feelings against new organization of the torso. You, you may discover that you are, in fact, uh, arching the back. Well, you will find that when you are asked to lengthen, it's as if you're asked to arch in the other way. And once arching in the habitual way is really uh, like uh, agreeable and fine and uh, associated with rest deep down. When you're asked to suddenly bend in the other direction, oh dear, my God, you will, uh, it, it, it's like mentally and physically strenuous to do it. The stimulation is horrendous. The problem is not there. The problem is explained by Alexander. The fact is, he becomes panic-stricken by the effect of the new experience. He's mentally incapable of considering the facts of the case. For his reasoning power, he's thrown completely out of use by the, by the unusual. And so... Um, what is important in the lessons of conscious guidance is, yes, the person is going to feel apprehension. I, mean, I remember some teachers telling me about their apprehension of giving lessons. Uh, they were waiting for the pupil to come. And uh, of course, they appear, they appear regal and, and, and absolutely displaying absolute nerve control. But um, you have to understand that very often you can appear very uh, calm if you reduce the number of movement you're making. If you slow down, you will appear very calm when in fact you're not. <laughs> there is a difference between what you feel inside and the appearance. It's not the same thing. So the capacity to change the appearance is what the actor uh, business is about. The actor is playing a role. Yes? And some people are good at this. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tool in communication that we need to use. So it's necessary at this moment when we are very heavily stimulated to, in fact, uh, hold on our reasoning power. It, it's not a question of, uh, of feeling good or feeling bad. It's a question uh, of using our reasoning power to solve problems, to solve questions like this. And so coming back to Alexander, this is the idea is, uh, is displaying, is uh, changing the pupil's manner of general use is going to change the reaction to fear. We, in the lesson, it would be uh, unprofessional to try to protect the pupil. This is not a psychotherapy. This is not a uh, sort of uh, soothing of the pupil. This is really bringing the pupil to uh, confront his uh, habitual reaction. You cannot have a control of human reaction if, you, if the human reaction is not shown. If the person during the lesson is always protected from our own uh, undue reaction to stimuli, uh, the person is not learning anything. 
the person is uh, maybe calm during the lesson, but it's going to be even worse later. The more, uh, the more you protect someone, uh, the more the person is going to be exposed. It's, 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 not, it's not making sense. So, during uh, the lessons, I'm going to show you, uh, for example, what's happening during a conscious guidance lesson. You have a, a gentleman and uh, he's asked to perform in control condition. As you can see, he's seated and there are, uh, I have represented rulers to show that uh, it's been clearly explained that the bone of the ankle and the uh, lower sternum, which is the center of rotation of the rib cage, are set at a very uh, clear distance from the wall. Uh, the teacher knows that, yes? And so what is requested is to simply stand up. Yes, but it has been shown that every time the person was responding to that stimulation, the person wanted to, in fact, throw the middle torso forward and unduly lift the chest, which was, uh, in fact, uh, showing on video that the person was arching the back. It's very, very clear that on this video, the person is not arching the back. Yes, the person is using verbal instruction to direct the different movements of the mechanism of the torso with the mechanism of the legs and arms, as it is shown here, in such a way that the person, well, will stand maintaining the center of the rib cage on at the same distance from the wall than the ankle. Yes, well, it's more or less uh, uh, done. Well, it's uh, for the people who know how to read these uh, these images. You will see that well, it's 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 not a brilliant uh, effort. Uh, there are uh, things that are not working very well. It's uh, it's clear that the person is bending the arm a bit more in the third image, and so that the lower part of the rib cage is thrown forward of the ankle changing, of course, the equilibrium of the structure and uh, forcing the person to respond muscularly. And they, it's shown in the last image, for example, that the person is leaning forward. He, the person has difficulty for the moment translating some principle into practice and the person has a difficulty to keep the back back in standing. But apart from that, there is something else, is that the, the, the teacher is now able, despite the difficulty. And um, a, a difficulty is, uh, is made uh, more uh, of a strong stimulus when you know about it. And this teacher knows about it. He's, he's seen a few uh, of his uh, videos where he's seen performing, and he knows that he has a difficulty with uh, having the lower sternum go away from the wall. He has difficulty extending the torso. And there is a, also uh, a habit of feeling uh, all his life he's been uh, letting the hips too far forward and the upper chest too far back. Uh, well, you, when you have constructed a habit for 50 years, uh, you can't imagine that you're going to solve that habit in, in, in two weeks or two months. It's, uh, it's inconsiderate, of course. So it's very interesting to perform in these conditions. These are conditions that you would call conditions of stress. And somebody's looking at you and somebody is, uh, is observing how this is going and how you are now performing the same um, situation which has always created a problem before. Well, if you are not stressed there, you're never going to be stressed. This is very interesting. We want to see how the person is going to react. And we find that the more the person, well, even if the procedure is not respected or it's a failure, if you want, even if it's a failure, we can see that the, the person general manner of general use is really not that bad. 
because uh, we can see that the head is very far forward, that the neck is very long, so it must be not tense and free, and the back is really widening and lengthening. So the person is constructing conditions for reacting to stimuli. It's absolutely obvious that when the person will be, uh, well, capable of uh, directing the movements in this way, the movements of the different parts of the torso in this way, the person's reaction to the stimulation is not going to be extreme. It's, uh, that is the principle Alexander has discovered, that use affect functioning in human reaction. And very often, I found that um, modern Alexander teachers tend to completely forget why Alexander was talking about uh, the undue excitement of the fear reflexes. He's, uh, he's clearly uh, connecting with this idea that there is a great variation in the, uh, in the response to stimulation. There are some people, they are completely thrown out of communication with their reason when they are stimulated. Well, there are others, uh, when they are stimulated, they are, uh, well, very interested. They, they start really to reason out the conditions and reason out the, uh, the why and the wherefore, what could be the means whereby to change this situation. This is the purpose of the lessons of conscious guidance and control. The purpose of the lessons of guidance and control are not to, in fact, uh, uh, communicate uh, the use of the self of the teacher directly. The, the idea is not to impress the other with, uh, with one uh, balance, with one equilibrium, or to transmit one's balance or one equilibrium to, one, to some other person. So certainly not. That's uh, a completely uh, egotistic version of the Alexander technique that we hear about nowadays. So this is the introduction to what comes now, which is uh, uh, what Alexander explains. He says, my experiences therefore convinced me that in any attempt to control habitual reaction, the need to work to a new principles assert itself. The principle, namely, of inhibiting our habitual desire to go straight to our end, trusting to feeling for guidance, and then of employing only those means whereby, which indirectly bring about the desired change in our habitual reaction, which is the end. So, uh, I understand that uh, this kind of sentence is, um, is very general and there are no precise definitions of the, the group of words. It's, uh, it's necessary to, Alexander is asking of us, when I say it's necessary, it's, he's asking of us to fill the blanks and, and have our own idea. So there is a whole book before that sentence uh, or a whole book after that sentence to explain what he means. Uh, very often we do not uh, fill the blanks. So we are uh, teachers and our aim is to uh, teach our pupil how to control habitual reaction. This is absolutely obvious. Yeah, fine. Uh, so there is a need to work to a new principle. The new principle is not to protect the pupil. The new principle is not to accept the pupil as he is. Uh, the pupil uh, is there and uh, we are not to encourage the mind of acceptance. There is this idea that uh, uh, there is the mind of acceptance and there is the mind of trying. And the mind of trying is bad. The mind of trying is, uh, is why uh, the person, in fact, uh, well, suffers from not having uh, the reaction he wants. So it's better not to want anything. It's better to lie down and to rest. Well, this is absolutely contrary to the principle that Alexander, in fact, uh, has uh, constructed. 
because the principle he has constructed is about uh, organizing the mind with uh, instructions. And uh, at first, when you start playing with it, well, you will find that, uh, wow, uh, this is easily said and done. At first, there are many uh, impediments, many, well, to say it clearly, there are many possibilities of failure. Uh, at first, there is uh, mostly failure, by the way. The person is going to, de to discover that uh, she has uh, a very great difficulty to disassociate movements. She, she can uh, think of different movements, but when it's time to go in practice and uh, employ only those means whereby that were decided, so we decided that in order to lengthen and widen the back, it was necessary to rotate the ribcage and to rotate the pelvis in a certain definite manner described by the new orders of movements. Well, uh, the person may understand what we are talking about, may have an idea or may see when it's not done, but uh, when it's time to, uh, well, uh, enter into action and react to the stimulus of uh, any activity, like going to stand, well, the person finds out that uh, it feels absolutely strange not to go and follow the habitual course of uh, trusting for feeling to feeling for guidance. It's a situ situation that has to be encountered time and time again before the pupil can really use his reasoning or her reasoning to deal with the question to deal with, uh, uh, well, how to transform theory into practice. It's, uh, it's something to, to use words and, and, um, and present, in fact, uh, what is called very often uh, a, an undefinable uh, use of the self. The use of the, the use of the self, something you cannot describe. Well, we can. We can describe the geometry of the movement we observe. We see uh, whether the pupil is lengthening the back or not. We see whether the pupil is as the head forward enough of the line of the back. It's, uh, it's something that is uh, easy to discover. So just after this, uh, this sentence, there is another one. I'm going to, to, to look at three sentences. The second one is this one. The task of reasoning out and selecting the effective means of bringing out psychophysical change, according to this new principle, is not an easy one. But the real task begins when we start to put into practice the procedures with which we have decided upon. For this, as Dewey puts it, presupposes a revolution in thought and action. The task of reasoning out and selecting the effective means of lengthening the back, of widening the back. Uh, we have discussed this many times in the initial Alexander technique that I teach. This means that we need to reason out and select uh, instructions of movements. We want the different bony parts of the mechanism of the torso to move in a certain way when we are going to stand, for example. These movements are not visible. It's only their effects. If you rotate the rib cage in a certain way, and if you rotate the pelvis at the same time, you will find that uh, there is a tendency to lengthen the back. It's a fact. Now, uh, to obtain this organization of movement, this coordination, this manner of use of the general self um, is quite easy in, in some conditions. Well, it's not important. What is important is the capacity to maintain these conditions when we are stimulated. Uh, being able to do it uh, uh, when there is no stimulation, in fact, presents very little interest. So it's possible to stimulate oneself. It's possible to get uh, uh, this fear 
of uh, wanting to perform. So when you're sitting, when you're doing anything, when you're uh, walking in the street, it's just uh, having some attention on how you project different instructions. So you just need instructions. So when, in, when we are in the lessons, we always discuss we always reason out, we always deliberate upon uh, the effective means of bringing out a psychophysical change. We, we discover that uh, uh, some instructions may work well with certain people and other instructions of movement will, will not. And so it's interesting to discuss, observe, so that the person that is having the lesson is becoming the teacher of himself or the teacher of herself. Uh, I, I, I teach people to become teachers. Uh, whether they want to be teachers or not is not the point. The, the idea, or they don't have to uh, want to become professional teachers and make money out of it. Uh, it, it suffices. It, it, they have to, in fact, become the teacher of themselves. They will discover that their uh, reaction to stimulation are uh, very ingrained and it's not possible to get rid of uh, this reaction uh, by having a lesson a week or less than a month with a professional. They have to take charge. It's uh, the condition of the initial exam. The technique is that the pupil has to become his own teacher. It's, it's impossible for a teacher, for any teacher, how, how good you can imagine a teacher can be, to be able to solve problems for the pupil. No. Uh, and it goes against the idea of conscious guidance and control. Uh, the conscious guidance of course, control is of the individual. So the individual becomes a teacher. So the, 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 it's absolutely clear that in the way I see teaching, it's necessary for the pupil to engage into the task of reasoning out uh, and selecting the effective means of uh, uh, coordination. It, it, it's not sufficient that somebody else, maybe Alexander, maybe others, maybe the, me, the home teacher, the, 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 the real teacher, uh, have an idea of uh, uh, how to reason out and how to select the effective means of uh, coordination. No. It's necessary for the pupil to engage into this work uh, on his own. And it's, it's not uh, that difficult. I just uh, show how is it that I reason out movements and the person can st start to think about it and start to criticize this. But th this is absolutely uh, necessary. The person will criticize, say, oh dear, uh, yes, this movement and this movement create this. I is it absolutely right? or? Um, does it work? Does it? Uh, if I look at people walking in the street, uh, do I see the same thing as a teacher does? Can I imagine some movement that would change the shape of the mechanism of the torso while the person is walking, for example? So it's not easy uh, to, to to reason out these these uh, decisions of movements. Well, uh, at first. When you have no idea of what uh, we are talking about, of what is uh, organizing the movements in order to assume a posture, uh, of course, of, at first it's not easy. But it's not because it's difficult that we are not uh, de de dealing with it. It's because it's difficult that we have lessons. Very often uh, I have some teachers that say, well, I'm, I'm really poor at this. I say, how many lessons did you have with me? I can't remember. Oh, yes, four. So uh, we, we do not expect people to be good at this. You don't have to be good at it. It, it doesn't have to be easy, if you want, for you to start dabbling in it. Of course not. This is, not, <laughs> this is the point of, of learning something. So that is uh, not so easy at first. And yes, the real task uh, comes when we, we have reasoned out these uh, instructions of movements that we want to see uh, all together. Well, uh, the real work is to, uh, will start when you put into practice uh, the procedures. 
And so it's the, the moment when we will see whether you're capable to stick to the decision you have made. You, there, are, there are decisions that comes from the intentions of movement that you reason out as the best to create the coordination you want with the mechanism of the torso. And then there is the moment when the, you have to, well, uh, put into practice these procedures. This is also a, mo a moment of apprehension. But, uh, the first is because uh, you don't know if you are uh, capable of uh, performing these movements. Nobody knows. Uh, you've, you've performed different movements all the time. Every single time you are going to stand, you have performed movement according to what felt right to you. You have had many, many uh, lessons of conscious guidance. You have uh, received hundreds and hundreds of uh, thousands of hours of touch lessons. Well, when it comes to put into practice the procedures you've decided upon, you suddenly discover that you don't know whether the camera is going to film exactly what we want to see and uh, whether the movement we don't want to see are not going to appear. You don't know. And so it's necessary to know. If it's, if it's fine, good. If it does not, if it, if it does not correspond to the model of lengthening and widening the back that Alexander has uh, given us, well, it's just a question of uh, uh, reason, uh, reason even more and think, wow, why is this? Why is this? Well, maybe it's because simply at the moment of uh, going up to stand, uh, the feeling, guidance, the mental direction that we call feeling guidance takes over. Fine. It's, uh, it's good to know. It's, uh, Alexander said, I need a way to know. Well, we have a way to know that he had, that he did not. We we have a, a camera, and there are many people that say, "Well, with a camera, you don't see anything. You you don't well, you don't uh, feel anything of the uh, of uh, what you can touch with your hands." Well, you can see quite a lot, really, and uh, most efficiently in order to see whether uh, you have uh, transformed your theory, that is uh, the series of instruction you think should produce the result you want to see, or not. That's all we need. And so the revolution in thought and action is um, more a revolution of thought and action. It's the, the idea of um, making sure that the speech we are using the instructions are really transformed into action. It's uh, because very often you hear speech and uh, fine, this is the theory. So somebody may have a theory that uh, uh, the wrong uh, movement that the person is seen doing is because the person is, is reacting to fear, is reacting to fear of uh, going outside or reacting to fear of having a meal to make or reacting to fear of having to, to produce some work. Well, uh, this is a very strange explanation. It's much and more interesting for the person to think, okay, uh, for the moment, there are moments when uh, my thinking is really uh, occupied by feeling, is really occupied by the emotion that uh, the practice, in fact, instill in my head. It's not, it's not practice itself. When the, very often, I have people that say, well, I have so much apprehension before the lesson. And at the end of the lesson, I'm so, I'm so glad. I'm so liberated. Well, it means that the person is has uh, too many thoughts that are uh, dwelling in feeling. And this is the, the, the exact idea Alexander has, the idea of uh, inhibition. Yes? So that is the, the last part of the sentence. I will, I will finish on that. It means that on the receipt of a given stimulus to perform some act, which we have decided is necessary for the change of our habitual reaction, 
consent to perform the act must be withheld, not given, in order that your habitual reaction may be held in check. And the usual messages to the motor nerve and muscle mechanism, which determine your manner of employing the primary control over your use in or habitual reaction, not projected. This clears the way for us to project new concerted messages, which in time will be associated with new and unfamiliar use of the mechanisms in activity thus bringing about a change in the employment of the primary control and thereby indirectly a change in the manner of our habitual reaction. In, in this, we have uh, the whole technique. We have uh, the inhibition of uh, the habitual acts that are guided by the feeling sense by the somatic sense, if you want, by the feeling, and uh, the projection of new messages. And uh, when people think that they are, uh, they are only the message, the message of the Alexander Technique is neck free and forward and up back to lengthen and, and, and widen, that is the end result that we want. How could the end result, in fact, produce the new uh, unfamiliar use of the mechanisms. It's impossible. So the fear reflex is a reaction, but there is an enormous variation in how we uh, display our reactions in the movements which can be filmed. So the idea is to start to control the conditions which make the, the, the reaction appear less and less. And so uh, this is the understanding I have of uh, why Alexander is not talking about uh, fear reflexes ever. Just uh, these words only. Always the undue excitement of the fear reflexes. And so our idea is not to protect the pupil, our idea is to strengthen the pupil reaction in the sense that the pupil will not have to try and be calm, try and, and stay uh, centered, or uh, uh, there are many other and gaining direction like this one. It's, it's not the point. When the person is reacting, the person is reacting. What we are interested in is having the person be able to formulate, reason out a series of orders. And also we want to see if the person in, in practice is capable of organizing these different movements so that they appear on screen as a, a lengthening and widening of the torso that is going to promote a head that is very far forward of the torso. And so um, in this, I wanted to, to show uh, how he, Alexander uh, sees the fact that uh, uh, the neck reaction in fear is not a consequence of the fear reflex. It's, uh, it's a condition of the fear reflex. It's completely uh, think, looking at things in the other way. So when Alexander observes a person that is stiffening the neck, he say, let's take, let us take, for example, the case of a man who habitually stiffen his neck in walking, sitting, ordinary acts of life. This is a sign that is endeavoring to do with the muscles of the neck, the work which should be done, which should be performed by certain other muscles, notably those of the back. And so uh, in this example, we see uh, it's, there is nothing to do with fear. There is something to habit of use of the different uh, parts of the back, of the different movements of the parts of the back. I hope this is clear. Any Excellent. question? Yes, Shonda. Well, a comment, really. 
Um, you talked about how Alexander was a Shakespearean actor and how he had the first uh, training course in Australia. He had them uh, do, uh, perform a play in order to learn how to do conscious guidance in adverse conditions. And it seems that, that the fact that he was an actor seems critical to the fact that he developed the technique. So people will tend to think, oh, he lost his voice so that's why the technique exists because he tried to get his voice to be to continue acting. But it seems almost it seems just as important or more the fact that the to be an actor you have to do movements against how you feel. You need to display uh, emotions physically, the, the visibly that you may not actually feel. And it seems that this kind of training, as well as the memorization of, of um, words, of, uh, of the long, long passages, uh, is central to the whole technique. And that's shown by uh, the development of the technique, and that will be shown by the fact that he actually had them do that on the training course. That seems, that seems uh, the ideal way to teach people how to use conscious guidance. And one yeah. last thing, the... The director in the place, in a way, is playing the... He's watching the performer and then telling them whether they're doing it correctly or not. So in a way, he's playing the role of, of our video. So we can use the video to teach ourselves, but he's the one giving the control of the performance. So actually within the technique, as you're explaining it here, the initial Alexander technique, there is the element that is... It's, um, you can see the element of the performance of plays in the way it's organized. Yes. And let's not forget uh, stage fright. Because uh, when, you're, when we're discussing the fear reflexes, when the person is said out of communication with, with a reason, well, you have to understand the, the effects of stage fright on people. They, they, they forget lines that they know perfectly well they would have been absolutely capable of telling the same lines um, at a cafe to their friends. Well, now they are on stage and uh, their mind is blank. And if there is no prompter, they're in real trouble. And they are, they are all, their mind is all uh, suffocated by feelings, by uh, was, uh, in the pit of the stomach or, or the hands sweating or anything like this. Yes, this is uh, clear uh, to me, at least, that the initial Alexander technique is, uh, well, could uh, very, very well have been developed by an actor. Oh, yes, he was. So, yes, I agree totally <laughs> with what you say. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and being standing on stage in front of a group of strangers performing when you're very nervous and um, scared is very different from lying down uh, on a table or on the floor, focusing on your own feelings uh, on your own. Well, it's difficult to see how the two things could uh, be related as a, a treatment or a cure. Uh, it makes, makes not, re not much sense. And uh, very often I have uh, lay people people that are not from the Alexander Tetic world that are having lessons with me, they say, but uh, I could never understand this thing of lying down on the table. Yeah. I had the same reaction when I started to have lessons with a, a Jew, a correct a teacher, a stat teacher. Why would she? She didn't know really well the books that I've read for 15 years and I wanted so many answers and she could not answer anything, but she wanted me to lie down for half an hour. I, it, was like, uh, it was like madness. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, we will stop there. And uh, for people watching the video, if you want to book a lesson with Jean Do, you can find the link underneath and we'll see you in the next video. Thank you, Jean Do. Thank you.